So this is the online clip for exercise 4. You can see that section note on here before we get to the first question. Bring the questions to this exercise. Please bring them along to your exercise group meeting as well. There will be new questions, but they will refer to the questions we're going to discuss here. So it's important that you bring them along. So first question. It's well known that when a regressor is measured with measurement error, instrumental variable estimation is preferable compared to OLS. Briefly explain why. Well, I'm not going to go into the details because we basically the, the lecture notes go through the details of why this situation brings along with it regressors that are correlated to uh, the error terms. Basically, what we're going to have here is I've got a constant the situation where we are regressing a model. And if both of both of these are so we have a dependent variable that's observed, but we labeled our explanatory variable xi as asterisk because it was unobserved. And that means this regression is cannot be estimated. Because there, that s uh, x asterisk is unobserved. What we usually will request is y i equals alpha plus beta x i plus some error term. And that's a different error term here. That x i is an observed version of x i asterisk, and this can be estimated. This can be estimated. However, we need to say how x i asterisk and x i are related to each other. And the key is that x i, I think that's the way I had it in the lecture notes, is measured with some measurement error. I think the error terms are called differently here, but it doesn't matter. Okay, so this guy here was measurement error. So the xi is different to the xi asterisk, which we really want in our model, and to which that coefficient beta relates to. And the difference is that measurement error ei, and epsilon i. And the problem is that under these conditions, the observed random variable and the error, so the observed explanatory variable and the error term in that regression will in general be unequal to zero. So our zero conditional mean assumption is breached and that implies that beta hat all s is biased and inconsistent. Consistent. So let me just briefly repeat. So this was one reason. So measurement error, let me measurement error, was one reason why we may end up with this situation, a breach of the zero conditional mean assumption. So I'd say that was one. The second, and that's an old problem, is a omitted relevant variable. Relevant variable know that from semester one. And the third is simultaneous equation. So that is sort of the case when really it's not only y that depends on x, but so it's not only that y depends on x, but also that x depends on y. And if we are not taking this into account, if we are only looking at that black relationship, we end up with this situation. Okay, we are not really equal. Well, how, what, how did I write equation? So it's this is a case we are not really talking about in the lecture.
yet. I just wanted to have it mentioned. Great. So, and it's in such situations when you're faced with this situation that uh, what we want to do is we want to apply what's called an instrumental variable estimation. And again, I'm not going to go through the details, but that instrumental variable estimation uses what's called an instrument, and that basically breaks this link between xi and vi. We will still keep our xi in the regression, okay? but we will estimate beta by a somewhat different way, not by all this. Again, details in the lecture. This was just a quick review of why we may need that. So let's continue with the second question. Here we go. So the second question refers to some research paper. It's actually not a directly an econom economic paper. It's more uh, it, it's published in the Journal of Epidemiology. So it's a bit of a medical paper. It's about uh, the health effects of smoking, bad effects we know, but the, uh, one reason for doing this is to sort of measure how, how much or how bad the effect is. And of course, you can immediately see what links to economics are. Bad health, health outcomes of smoking have potentially very severe cost implications for the NHS, for the National Health System. And immediately, in just one sentence, you've seen how this can be linked to economics, because we're in a situation where the NHS has to, to be extremely economical with its resources. And again and again, you know that the discussion comes up of over those who need the NHS because of their lifestyle choices. That may not only be smoking, may also be alcohol, maybe extreme sports. Uh, the, the question arises again and again whether the NHS should really cover this. Anyway, that, um, enough of the sort of the economic link. We'll just look at this straightforward as the question: How are how bad are the health effects of smoking? We know they're bad. The question is how. Now, in that paper, uh, you, you the dependent variable is what's called a, a measure, a variable that measures physical health. Okay. And that is sort of self-reported, it's an index measure, it basically measures how well you can do certain everyday things, and it's a combination of several things. And the better you can do that, the healthier you are, at least physically. Okay. And the explanatory variables in this particular case are the number of cigarettes you smoke per day, the age, how many children you have, plus quite a lot of other variables. If you're really interested in that, you can look at the paper, in, I think, in the, uh, in the question. Yeah, I have the, full, I have the full reference here, and through the library website, you, you have free access to that journal. So. Now, in that paper, there are two regression results presented. Actually, I have it open here, and they're presented in Table 1. They are the, in Table 1, they are the, the second and the third column. Okay, it's uh, these results here, and these results, these and these. And you can see, so here, actually, just quickly, you can see what sort of the other variables are. They are dummy variables for your gender, whether you're employed, what type of medical system you're on, whether you're part of the military, whether you're insured, and so forth. Okay, I'm not really interested in them. What we are interested in is the impact of the variable cigarettes per day. Okay, so are we, how closely is that, in the paper it's called the treatment variable, how closely is that related to the health outcome, and that variable is called SF12. So the two results here, I just summarized the sort of most important bits that's relevant for us here. This is our model, what 
Model 7, actually, Model 8 is exactly the same, but there are two, two estimations, 7 and 8. So in 7, that model is estimated by OLS, and in 8, that model is estimated by IV. So it's exactly the same model, and that's important to realize, as we stressed in the lecture, we're not changing the model. All we, all we are changing is how these parameters are estimated, and we need instruments. And the instruments are the constant, that's equivalent to the constant here, CPR. Now CPR, I need a different color for this. CPR is the average price of a pack of cigarettes in the state of the IFED respondent. Okay, so that's called what CPR. So that CPR, that is basically the instrument for CPD, cigarettes per day. And you can see all the other variables correspond correspond to variables in the model. Actually, I should have used that CPD. Because age corresponds to age, number of children corresponds to number of children, and in fact this is the same set of other variables as appearing as explanatory variables. So it's CPD that is basically instrumented by CPR. Now, this is now also the first question. Why do you think that the authors reported an OLS and an IV estimation for their model? You can see from the particular IV estimations the, the authors used is that they believe that CPD and the error term, the epsilon i, they believe that these two guys are not uncorrelated. Okay, and therefore they conclude we need IV. So you can read that in the paper, but you can take this from here. Okay, from just seeing these two information, possibly could have been clear in the questions that this is an OLS estimation and this describes an IV estimation. And from that IV estimation, you can find out, if you look at the instrument set, you're, you can see which variable has been excluded from that instrument set, and so that's the CPD variable, and which variable is it sort of in inverted commas replaced with, that's the CPR variable. Okay, so we, therefore we can conclude the authors think that the CPD variable and the error term are correlated with each other. So that then basically leads us to the question why so firstly why may this be the case okay why can we think that CPD and epsilon i may be correlated remember our three potential reasons and in a way you can think of all these three in this case let's start with the third one with the third one first, simultaneous equations. Well, could it be that the number of cigarettes you smoke is a function of the health outcome? Here we model it the other way around. We say health outcome is a function of the cigarettes you smoke. But of course, I think many of us possibly know people who realize once they are feeling worse, once their body says, hey, I can't do any, everything anymore, then they realize, hmm, Perhaps I should stop smoking. So in fact, it could very, very well be that we have a problem of simultaneous equation, equations here. So you know, actually, let's go, let's say third, we could have simultaneous equations. CPD may depend on your state of health. state of health and that could be proxied by that variable SF12. All right, what about the second reason we listed before, omitted variables? Ah, sorry, no, what was it? Measurement? No, omitted variables. Okay, then let's continue with that. Omitted variables. So what we are basically saying here is there should be some variable that is related 
to CPD and also related to SF12 genu genuinely. Okay, and that is a little bit difficult to really argue what sort of variable that could be. But it could be, you, you could imagine, for instance, a propensity to live healthy. So it could be just sort of an attitude variable. And that attitude, if you have this attitude and behave accordingly, that could clearly influence your health on all sorts of levels. And it may also impact on how many you smoke. If you want to live healthy, you smoke less. If you don't care, you smoke more. Okay. So let's just say this could be attitude to living healthy. And that would have the hallmarks of an omitted variable that causes the problem of leaving CPD correlated with epsilon because that attitude of living healthy effect would be captured by this epsilon, by this error term, and it would be correlated to CPD. So that would cause CPD to be correlated to the error term. And also, you could think of measurement error. So how, the, uh, how are these data obtained? That's some sort of questionnaire. So someone asks, how many cigarettes do you smoke per day on average? And you give an answer, but clearly you don't know exactly. So measurement error could be a problem here as well. So in this case, the reasons are, could be this, could be this, could be this. It doesn't really matter. I think altogether it's quite sort of plausible that we have a problem. Second question in this context is then why could CPRI be a valid instrument? Instrument. So remember, so let CPR, what we need is that expected value of CPR and CPD is unequal to zero. So the two are correlated. Now what's CPR? This is the average price of a cigarette in the state, the, the respondent to the questionnaire, so object I, or respondent I, lives. So the average cigarette price in the state where you live. Now is it plausible to believe that people on average smoke more if cigarettes are cheaper? I think it's pretty plausible. So I think without much ado, I would possibly put a tick in here. Second question is, is CPR I and the error term, how did we call it, epsilon 1 I, are they uncorrelated? So in a way, we have to think of our three potential reasons why we may have the problem of X and Epsilon being correlated. Firstly, the, so it's difficult to argue. Let me not argue about case three, but that's because that's a little bit difficult to argue and we are not talking about simultaneous equation in our course. So let's think about the omitted variables, this attitude to living healthy variable. Well, this CPI is really measured on the state level. Okay, so this is measured on the state level. So therefore it's quite likely or it's, it's implausible to think that it should be correlated to whether you live healthy or not, unless you think that people who live in a state where cigarette prices are more expensive tend to have a better attitude to living healthy. I, I think that may be quite difficult to argue. Secondly, would it be unrelated to the measurement error? What did we say? Measurement error would be the individual measurement error, someone not knowing exactly how much they smoke on average. There's absolutely no reason to believe why that measurement error should be related to the price of cigarettes uh, in the particular state the respondent lives. So I think without us really having the tools or having examined the tools for testing these sorts of things, we can possibly put a tick to this. 
So that then leaves us with 2b, the answer. Which of the two results would you rely on? Well, what we know is the following. Read the bad, read the bad result. If CPD times epsilon 1i, if these guys are correlated, then beta hat OLS, okay, as in uh, 7, as in 7, is biased and inconsistent. So that means even a large sample doesn't rescue you. Inconsistent. So in green, the good stuff, if Z is a valid instrument, is a valid instrument, um, sorry, yeah. I should say not Z, but we know what it is here, it is uh, CPR. If CPR I is a valid instrument, then beta hat IV as in 8 is, and I should say, actually I can't remember what exactly I said in the lecture, um, certainly consistent. It's usually actually difficult to prove any small sample, therefore, like unbiasedness property in the case of instrumental variable. So we'll, we'll go safe and say it's consistent. That means if you have a large enough sample, you should on average get it right. That means on average, beta hat IV will hone in onto the unknown population parameter beta. In fact, it turns out, let's just check how many observations we have here. I think to use technical terms, it's a load. It's several thousand. I can't immediately find that information. I have a visual memory of where on the page, it's the bottom left of some page, information of how many observations we have. I'm for sure it is several thousand. Here, here we go. Thirty more than thirty-four thousand. Okay, so that's pretty damn big. So therefore, which one would we go for? Clearly the IV estimator. So the third question will be a maximum likelihood question. Here we go. So let's see, what information are we given? We have very standard linear regression model. So this is, in a way, the boring case, okay? because we are looking at a linear regression model. And I told you in the lecture that really maximum likelihood in that case doesn't really bring us that many advantages. In fact, it turns out the OLS estimator, parameter estimators are just as good as the maximum likelihood estimators because they're exactly the same. However, perhaps the familiarity of our example will help to uh, bring across the idea of maximum likelihood in a different way than what I tried in the lecture. So here we go, a linear model. Now importantly, the error term, we assume here that these error terms are normally distributed. And I in fact assume that the variance so the variance of that vi is equal to 1. Okay? Usually we wouldn't know that. Okay? Well, we'd be happy to know that they are normally distributed and then we'd say, okay, with some variance. But to make the problem simpler, I set the variance to 1. Okay? Then I will simplify the algebra. You can leave that generic and uh, possibly in, in all 
almost all textbooks that introduce maximum likelihood will go through this example and usually with the generic case. So what the question now is we want to write down a likelihood and a log likelihood function for the first two observations y1 and y2. Okay, so we have two observations. For each observation we have a value for the dependent variable and a value for the explanatory variable. And also you are just given the density for a normal distribution because this is what we need. Okay, remember in the lecture we were talking about Poisson distribution and I had to give you the that information that precisely describes the Poisson distribution. These were Poisson was a discrete distribution, so we basically I wrote down the probability. This is a continuous distribution and therefore so VI is continuous. use and therefore f is a density. Okay. So let's see what have we got here. When we have any given normally distributed random variable the density will basically look 1 over the square root of 2 pi times the variance of that density times the exponential of random variable minus expected value squared divided by 2 times the variance. In our case this will simplify because we know both the expected value I will color code this, the expected value of vi we know to be 0 and we know the variance of, v, of vi. Actually here I see a little mistake this one here should be a vi. Okay, and we know the variance of vi because that is equal to 1. So, here we go, let's simplify. That simplifies to 1 over the square root of 2 pi, because that guy is 1, times the exponential of negative v minus the expected value, which is 0, squared divided by 2 times 1 and in fact as you can see v minus 0 squared is of course nothing else but v squared v squared so that's the density of of our uh, I shouldn't forget the i of our error term vi. Now somehow I need to write this likelihood function. Now the important thing is that we can reformulate the vi or that equation 9. We can solve it basically for vi and what we get is yi minus alpha minus beta times xi. And this, of course, you know this to be the error term or in the estimated version, the residual. So basically hidden behind this vi are the observations and the parameters. Okay, That means all the terms on which our likelihood function depends. So that means we can write down the basically we can write down the density for our first error term as and I'll just write it underneath for reasons which will become obvious in a minute. So the density for the first error term is one over square root of two pi times the exponential times v1, but v1 is just y1 minus alpha minus beta times x1. So y1 minus alpha minus beta times x1 squared, because we have v squared, divided by 2. And we can write down v1 
identity for the second. That's going to be 1 over square root of 2 pi exponential of y2 minus alpha minus beta times x2 that squared divided by 2. So now what I want is the likelihood function means I'm for both observations, that means I need to connect these. I know that if these two guys were independent, I could just multiply them. So if they were independent, I could, so then I would get the likelihood function. I just leave all, you know, all these guys here. Now you can think, think them there. If they were independent, the vi, v1 and v2, I could just multiply them. Are they independent? Well, look at this distribution. For each vi, we have a standard normal distribution here. There's no dependence in here, so that means they are independent. Okay? v2 doesn't depend in its expected value or its variance on the previous v. So they are indeed independent. That means our likelihood function is just this guy. Now I asked for the log likelihood function as well, the log likelihood function, and basically we get the following result. So instead of a product, this will turn into ln fv1 plus ln fv2. Now let me just simplify this equation on it. Just to illustrate how this will look a little better, 1 over square root of t pi is of course nothing else but Just this guy here, of course, the same as one over two pi to the half, or two pi to the negative a half. So, and if you now remember your logarithm rule, if we log, uh, if you take the log of a value times an exponent, that will be the same as the exponent times the log of this value. So what we get here is negative a half times the log of 2 pi. And then we also have, again, the log of product is uh, the same as the sum of the logs. That's why we do the log function in the first place, but that also is valid for this product. Remember there's a product here, this guy times this guy. And we have the log of the exponential. These two operations just cancel each other out. That means we are just left with y1 minus alpha minus beta x1 squared a half. And then plus second and here we again get negative a half log of 2 pi plus and we have oh I did I forgot something do, 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 do. here is a negative sign in the exponent so that's a negative sign and a negative sign here that means we have a negative sign here and a negative sign here, so y2 minus alpha minus beta x2 squared divided by 2 and there's two parentheses here, I hope that possibly just fits in. We'll just simplify the, uh, the signs a little bit plus and minus, so that would just be a minus. And I can take the 
these parentheses away. It's going to be a minus. And then we have plus and minus. So here we have a minus again. And here is a minus. So altogether, that's going to be a minus. So all these guys are actually going to be just minuses. Okay, so we get this. And now we can actually simplify a little bit because we see that we have two times the same term. So that is therefore just negative two times one over a half ln two pi. I just I could cancel this out other out for the uh, for the sake of the in class tutorial I'll leave it as it is. So we have these two things, and then we have these two terms. Well, they have a common factor, so I'll write negative a half. And then we have this guy and this guy, and basically what this is is the sum of y i minus alpha minus beta xi squared for i equals 1 to 2 because we have two observations. You can check that this these two this term is exactly equal as these two as these two guys. Okay. That's this guy. Okay, and uh, that's is basically the result. That's, this is what the question asked for. Okay, Write down the likelihood and the log likelihood function for the first two observations. And that's what you, what you have done. So just as a reminder, what the maximum likelihood estimate does is it basically chooses so the ML estimator finds the values of alpha and beta that maximizes maximizes the log likelihood function. Okay, or in fact the likelihood function. If you maximize the likelihood function, you also maximize the log likelihood function. So and this was all that was asked in uh, this question three. Okay, and there's a little bit of a continuation of that in the exercise class. So, thank you.